Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Central Study Hour. Those who attend in the sanctuary and those who's joining us, happy Sabbath. And I welcome all of you who's joining us. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath with us worshiping here. Uh, we have two song requests we received. The first one comes from Lainey in California. Lainey requests song number 462, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Let's sing this with full spirit. All stanza. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, precious of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Thank you for sending that song this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long thank you laney for sending that song if you have a favorite sim song that you would like to share with us on the upcoming sabbath please visit the church website at sacscentral.org and click on the contact us csh hymn request and tell us more about yourself where you're writing from, your name, email address, and the song request. We'll sing that song on the upcoming Sabbath. Let's turn on the second song request. This one comes from Oscar De Marchi in Argentina, all the way from Argentina. Oscar requested song number 368, Watchmen Blow the Gospel Trumpet. Let's sing this song all stanza. Trumpet, every soul a warning gives. Whosoever gives the message will repent and turn and live. Blow a trumpet, trusty watchman, always loud on and in God's commission send the message. Oh, 
song let's bow our head for prayer dear heavenly father thank you lord giving us another opportunity in this world to spend sabbath holy sabbath day as we depart from all of our busyness in work in our worldly life we pray that you keep us away from all distractions in our worship and adoration this sabbath day so that we can plug in our faith to you lord jesus christ in worship and adoration especially as we are going to be studying the word of god we pray that as we open the scripture we find your truth we find your will in our lives to wait for your second coming thank you lord for hearing and answering our prayer in jesus name we pray amen the lesson is going to be the new quarter it's going to be discussing god's mission to us part one and the lesson is going to be bring up by our head elder brad stevens i hope you have a blessed study hey welcome to central study hour we're glad that everybody is here with us today everybody who's here in the sanctuary who everybody who's watching online it's just an honor and a pleasure to be able to worship the lord with you today we are going over the new quarterly the first lesson of the new quarterly, and the title is God's Mission, My Mission. All right, we'll be going over the very first lesson, and that is titled God's Mission to Us, Part One. So there's going to be a part two. So this is part one, God's Mission to Us, Part One. And if you are either listening or watching this online, or if you're here even in the audience, and you would like a copy of this to possibly share with somebody else or watch again yourself, you can uh, get a hold of us at uh, csh at saccentral.org here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, or you can give the office a call at 916-457-6511. Give us all of your information, especially your name and address. Uh, those are the most helpful to be able to email you or send something out to you. And you can uh, let them know that it is offer C202340. So that offer again is C202340. So, God's mission to us, part one. Doesn't everybody want to know about God's mission to us? Amen. So when we go over new quarterlies, uh, I think a lot of us open up to the lesson for the first Sabbath, and we immediately start reading. But usually there is some information for us and an introduction into the lesson. And the introduction into the lesson actually has a title. And the title is Quit Talking and Start Doing. Yeah, start doing something. You're right. So quit talking and start doing something. And obviously, this is talking about God's mission, right? We need to start, stop talking about it, and we need to start doing it. Do something about God's mission. 
So if, if everybody read, there is, uh, they talk about an article that was published in Adventist magazine years ago, and it is a, it's a modern parable that somebody wrote. And it is, we can call it the swamp parable. The swamp parable. So we have here in, the, in this story, and you can read it in your lesson, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, what it says is, there is a village that is close to a swamp. And in swamps, you know, you have bogs, you have all of these areas where uh, people can actually fall into certain areas of the swamp and you, you can't get out. You'll either drown or there's other ones that are just caverns and you can fall into them. And uh, it, it really swamps are not really meant for to be inhabited by people. So this village was set up right by one of these swamps. And the problem was is that there often people would walk by and they would be hiking around and going into the swamp and they would fall into these caverns and then fall into these areas. And the villagers had a real problem with that. They, of course, they didn't want people to perish because the people in this situation, for some reason or another, these people couldn't get out. They couldn't get out. And there were screams of the dying. So the people who that were dying were screaming and crying out. So this village was having a problem with, and they didn't really have too much of a problem with the people dying. They really had a problem with the crying and the screams that they were hearing. So they had city council meetings in this village and everybody got together and they started talking about this issue. And while they were talking about this issue, they uh, really had to have some long meetings, extraordinarily long meetings to try and figure out what they were gonna do. But these meetings didn't lead to much action at first. And then they started doing some fundraisers. People started having yard sales and people started selling things and raising money. But they raised money to be able to feed the people who were in the meetings. It's, it's a little shock, right? They're feeding the people who are in the meetings instead of using those funds to be able to help somebody out. But this second idea that they had and this second thing that they did was fantastic. So they were tired of hearing the screams. So they finally, instead of feeding them, they started putting this money towards a, a building. So what they did was they made a dome around the people that were having the meeting. So they couldn't hear the cries of the people. Does that help anything with the people that are falling in and dying? No, it doesn't. But these people in this village spent so much time meeting together, coming together, so much time building a dome around their meeting place so they didn't have to hear the people screaming and crying and so that they could have a meeting in peace without having to hear that. They did nothing for the actual cause and the actual reason why they were meeting to be able to protect these people. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Does this sound like it could possibly be, or could there possibly be a group of people that could be meeting together and studying together and learning together on how to try and help people not die, but they actually do nothing? They spend time in their meetings and time together, eating and potlucking and very little time, if no time, doing anything on the outside. Hopefully that doesn't sound familiar to this church. Hopefully, maybe it's just maybe some of the people watching online, maybe it's their church, but it couldn't be here, right? So at times, I think we lose track of God's mission. We lose track of the purpose on why we're here on this earth. Because these people in the village, they had great intentions. They really wanted to work on this, but then they got caught up in themselves and eventually did nothing. So God has a mission. You could say that God is a missionary, right? By definition, God is a missionary. And from the time that he created Adam and Eve, he had a mission in place. This mission did not start with Abraham when he, God brought God's, his people together. It did not begin with Christ on earth. It did not begin with Paul and his mission. This mission of God started at creation. 
started at the creation. God's mission was to create us, to create humanity, and to have a relationship with us. That was his mission. That was his goal. He wanted to have a relationship with us, an intimate relationship with the people and the things that he created. Right? If you're, if your parents, if there are parents here, or even if you're a child, I think we can all understand this, that when a couple decides to have kids, they set themselves up on a mission, right? You have a mission. You're going to have kids, and you're going to, you plan to love them, to care for them, to be a part of their lives, and to share everything with them all of their life. The goods, the bads, the ups and downs. That's what, that's what we do as parents, right? Well, that's the same thing with God. His mission was to create us and to live with us and to interact with us. And when God first created Adam and Eve, that relationship was the relationship that he wanted. He actually had that intimate relationship where he had time and he was physically present with Adam and Eve, right? We've all learned about that. He was actually present in the garden with Adam and Eve. They had a, a nice dialogue, a, a great relationship. Adam and Eve fully understood what, what God wanted from them. They understood God's instructions. At least we think they did, right? They didn't fully understand, or they, they understood, but they, they kind of we, wavered a little bit. But everything started off the way God planned. There's a, a passage from Patriarchs and Prophets I want to share with you about this, about Adam and Eve in that relationship. It says, uh, you can find that Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, page 51. It says, so as long as they remained loyal to the divine law, their capacity to know, to enjoy, and to love would continually increase. When, isn't that great? They, when they were faithful to him, when they loved them, when they were with them, they would enjoy everything, and that would increase over time. They would be constantly gaining new treasures of knowledge, discovering fresh springs of happiness, and obtain clearer yet clearer conceptions of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God. While they were in their, the pre-sin era, before, when they were obeying God, this was what God had in store for them. But we all know that didn't last very long, right? Sin entered the world. But that did not mean that God's mission had ended, right? Because man and, and woman, or man in, in general, humanity, made that decision and sinned, that did not mean that God's mission was a failure and that he stopped that mission, all it meant was his mission changed a little bit. His, mis his uh, mission shifted to redeeming fallen humanity and to bring them back to him. But while doing that, he still wanted to maintain that relationship. So his mission still was to have a relationship. But in order to continue to have that relationship, he had to do some changing. He had to bring man back to him. And missions can change but yet stay the same, right? A mission, a general mission, if we think of this in, in war, our general mission can stay the same, but sometimes when you're, when you're fighting or when you're doing something, it, it can change, it can veer off, but the general mission is the same. So God's relationship changed from having that constant relationship, the physical presence and physical dialogue, to a little bit different now with, with Adam and Eve. But he still calls out to them. He still reaches out to them. He still wants to have that relationship. We can use maybe this as an example. If a, a parent has a child, and that child ends up going to jail, right? God forbid that would happen. But your child ends up going to jail. Well, your mission was to create a child and to be with that child and have a relationship. But once that child goes to jail, you no longer have the relationship that you had, right? You're either in front of bars or glass when you have that interaction. The interactions change, and it's a little bit different. But the mission of the parent is still the same. You still have that relationship. So this is kind of like what's happen happening here. The relationship has not changed. It's just shifted a little bit on how God needs to attack this mission. 
So we'll leave it there for now as, as an introduction. And before we actually move on and get into the lesson, this quarterly, I don't know if you read the introduction or if you've already gotten to Thursday, but this lesson has something different for us. Every Thursday, when you get to Thursday in your lesson, every week we are going to have challenges. And challenges where this lesson is going to call us to action, to do things to get out of our comfort zone and stop talking and doing something. Isn't that great? I hope that this does not change in all the lessons going forward from now until when Christ comes. We should all, I got a couple of amens here. We have, we should personally, each one of us have our own challenges, but it would be nice if we could do it together as a church and as a congregation. So, Hopefully, as we read this quarterly and we go on for the rest of the year here, hopefully at SAC Central, at least here, we can all make a pact together that we are going to week by week fulfill all of the challenges. Everybody want to do that? You, we'll, we'll get to Thursday and we'll talk about it. Some of these challenges are not too hard, but yet they are hard at the same time. Depends on what type of personality you have. But if all of us do it, we can do some great things. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that when we get a little bit farther into the study. We'll get to that on Thursday. So if you want to, let's go ahead and, and open up to Sunday, which is uh, after our introduction. And the title of Sunday is The God Who Reaches Out to Us. Does everybody feel like God reaches out to us? Can, can you feel that in your life? Always? Can you always feel it? <laughs> Sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to feel it. But yes, God reaches out to each and every one of us all the time. Whether we notice it or realize it or not, that's on us, right? But God's always out there constantly reaching out to us to try and get us. He is the creator of all. And I would have to say that he's a little bit busy. If you look at God's calendar... I like to put a lot of things on my calendar because I forget everything. If you look at God's calendar, it's, it's probably pretty full. But on that calendar, if you got into all of the details, your name daily is on that calendar. Where he says, Pam, I'm reaching out to Pam at 10 a.m. I have a special something for Pam, right? So we talked about it a little bit in creation that God created everything and everything was perfect in creation, right? It was beautiful. God gave Adam and Eve instructions and he told them what would happen to them if they disobeyed those instructions. And we know that our God is a God of love and he loves us and he made us in his image. But Satan had to come and ruin that. Because he didn't really like that, right? He doesn't really, he, him and uh, God are not on, uh, on the same page. And Satan knows that God made us to have this relationship with us. And he knows that God has this mission to constantly have this relationship with us. He had to come in here and, and mess everything up. Because even though he doesn't agree that God is a God of love, he knows that because of his own experiences that God is a God of love. And if you are love, you have to have free will. You cannot create, we cannot create robots. I think we all have that pretty clear. So we were made with free will to be able to make our own decisions. So that's where Satan's like, okay, now here, I'm going to get in here. I'm going to get God's creations, the things that he loves, and I'm going to destroy that. I'm going to have them disobey God. And Satan knows how much it hurts when you disobey God. He knows how painful it is for God. You know how he knows? Because deep down he saw it in God. When he himself disobeyed, he saw the pain in God's eyes. Once again, we refer back, I refer back to parents. And it doesn't have to be a parent. It can be a teacher. But when somebody 
Say you're the person that is doing the disobeying. And you go against what your parents have to say, or your aunt, or your uncle, or or a teacher, or somebody you look up to. When you disobey them, they always have that look, right? That little sad look. Like, oh. Because usually they know what's best for us. Parents, when our kids disobey us and they get in trouble and and bad things happen to them, we, we have that look. The kids know it, right? When they disobey and they look back. Well, Satan also knows that. So Satan wants to get everybody to disobey God and to turn. He wants God to be in that pain. He wants God to feel that pain. And he thrives on taking us away from God. That's what he wants to do. He wants to take us away from God and disrupt that relationship. God wants to be close to us. Satan wants to pull us away. Ephesians 1.4 says this. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. When? Before the foundation of the world. That they should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God's original plan had changed that moment that sin had entered. It had, remember we talked about it, it had shifted a little bit. It didn't necessarily change the whole thing. But his plan to create a race and to have a relationship had to, had to take on a, a, a different shape. And he wants us to obey him, right? But he wants us to obey him out of love. Out of love for him that we obey him and not out, out of fear. So now this mission, this mission of salvation is now in place. When God wants to bring us back to him and have salvation. If we look at our lesson in Sunday, it has us read Genesis 3, verses 9 through 15. And then it asks us a a question, and it says, what was God's first words to Adam? And we have that in our memory verse. Is verse 9, Genesis 3, verse 9. It says, Then the Lord called Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Did God know where Adam and Eve were? He knew where they were, right? This question is not a question of, of location. He's not wondering where, give me your coordinates to where you are. Tell me under what tree you are. So this is definitely not a question of location. So let's, let's recap here. When sin enters the world through Adam and Eve, God is now coming down to earth, and he is going to be with them. He is going to meet them in their normal meeting spot. So God comes down. No Adam and Eve. He knew that. But he still goes to that normal meeting spot. And then he asks the question. And his voice was be able to be heard. I don't think they were very far from that location, but they were hiding themselves. And the question was, where are you? And this, like we said, this isn't a question of location. This is a question of where are you in our relationship now? Right? Where are Adam and Eve in this relationship? And God gave them a little bit of time to think about this, right? To think about where they are. You, do you think that Adam and Eve, when they heard this question, were actually thinking about going, yeah, here, we're over here. Right? I don't think that was going through their heads at all. What was going through their heads is, yeah, where, where are we in this relationship? This is the first time they have ever disobeyed God. And they're scared. Things really changed once they disobeyed God and they did what he told them not to do. And God wants them to think about their consequences and about what they did. Isn't it funny that that God came down and he didn't ask them any other questions? He could have come down and, what did you do? Right? 
God didn't do that. That's what we do when we find our kids doing something. What'd you do? What's going on? But very calmly and full of love, God comes down and says, where are you? He wanted to examine themselves and they examine themselves and they realize that we're naked. We no longer have this light from God that was covering us up. And they were naked and they were afraid and they started to cover their bodies with leaves. Right? And even though they disobeyed God, even though we disobey God, unfortunately, probably on a regular basis, hopefully not so regular, but even though we do that, he is still out there searching for us. He is still out there looking for us. He's not looking for us to yell at us, to insult us, to tell us how bad we are. He's out there searching for us to bring us back to him. So now that we know that God is always out there and he is looking for us, what is your answer to that question? That question that he asked Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you with everything? All right, we just need to think about that. Where are we with God? Because we all have sinned. Uh, some of us, I think, have sinned a lot more than others. And some of us have committed sins worse than others. But it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how many times we've sinned. God is not just sitting there keeping track of us and going, oh, no, you get to a certain point and I, I'm not going to reach out to you anymore. No, he doesn't do that. He, he keeps track, right? We're keeping track, but we're not keeping track to say, okay, no, that I'm not going for this person, right? So where do we stand with our relationship with God? Genesis 3.15, those same verses that we were reading and discussing, it says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right? So here we have the scene. We have a scene with all the guilty parties. Right? We have God. There's Satan. There's Adam and Eve. All the guilty parties. Right? Because Satan's guilty there too because of what he did. And he tells them in previous verses what their punishments are. And then at this moment, he also starts in motion the plan to save mankind. Right? This is a, a prophetic statement from God himself on how things are going to go and how things are going to end. So chapter 3 in Genesis is not just about the fall of man. It is also about God's plan and his mission to bring man back at the same time. There's, there's very little time from when man sins to, to then him now saying a prophetic statement that he's going to bring everybody back right away. God chooses to bring us all back, to put a mission into play. And Jesus is a part of this plan. If we read into this prophetic statement here in Genesis uh, 3.15, that Jesus will win and he will bring us back to him one day. So Sunday, the God who reaches out to us. Monday is the Lord who longs to be with us. So go ahead and turn over into Monday. And here uh, we take a look at, to start off, we take a look at a couple of verses where God makes some promises to his people. Let's go ahead and see what those are. And this is where we can see God and his missionary nature for man. So we go to Genesis 17, 7 and 8. It says this, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I also give to you and your descendants after you the land which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. 
Amen to that, right? So we, he, we see here in these verses that even though man has sinned, even though they have, we have had some time since then, God still wants to be our God. He still longs to be in that relationship with us. And he makes sure that he is there for his people. And it's not just for the people then, right? It talks about the generations afterwards. We are these people in these generations afterwards. And he still loves us and he is still our God. In Genesis 28, 15, it says this. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. All right, how powerful is this? That God does not want to leave us no matter where we go. And some of us have gone some incredible distances from God. We have tried our best to escape him and to not be around him. But even all of those people who have spent a good part of their lives running from God, getting as far away from religion as they can, or get as far away from God's law as they can, God still wants to bring us back from wherever we've gone. And that's a, that's a great thing. He still wants to bring us back. And we can look at what God has done over, over time. And the next verses take us to, and they're talking about the sanctuary. If we go to uh, Exodus 29, 45 and 46... He, God chose, chose to be amongst his people in a different way from, from the time where Adam and Eve first sinned until now, God decides to do something different. So Exodus 29, 45 and 46 say this, I will dwell among the children of Israel and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among, among them. I and the Lord their God. If we read the last paragraph here of Monday, it, it, it elaborates a little bit more about what these verses mean. And it says this, what is the one, what is, what was one of the main purposes of the Old Testament sanctuary, right? We just read about the sanctuary where God was going to dwell amongst his people. And it says, God decided to be with his children in a different way. He confirmed to Moses his longing to dwell among the children of Israel in the building of the tabernacle and the establishment of of the very intentional and very purposeful system that would point to the ultimate instrument of his mission. So where was God dwelling? In the sanctuary. So now it changes from God being just their God to now God, God decided to get a little bit closer, right? Just a little bit closer to his people. So now he's dwelling in the sanctuary and he's giving them this, what he calls this purposeful system. In the system of sacrifice, in the system of coming to the sanctuary, and that's where the, the people can find God. It says this, the sacrificial offer, it says, the, this is the mission of Jesus Christ. The sacrificial offering and the priesthood of the Jewish system were instituted to represent the death and meditorial work of Christ. All those ceremonies had no meaning and no virtue only as they related to Christ. And you find that last statement in uh, Review and Herald on December 17th, 1872. Right? So God wanted to show his, his people a long time before Christ was going to come. He wanted them. He wanted to show them what the sacrificial system was. And he wanted to dwell amongst his people. And remember, at this time, the sanctuary in the tabernacle was a mobile sanctuary, right? So they had to pick this thing up as they were traveling and going, and, and they brought God with them, right? He decided to, to dwell amongst them in this way, because God really wants to be with each and every one of us. In different ways, he tries to get into our lives and be a part of it. Let's move on into Tuesday. 
the title of Tuesday, The God Who Became One of Us. So who is he talking about? Who are we going to be talking about here? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, right? So the God who became one of us. And the, the less, huh? One with us, sorry, yes, one with us. Yeah, not one of us, one with us, correct. So the lesson has us go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 and 23. And it says this, She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people for their sins. For all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So now God went from living in this sanctuary to actually being amongst us, right? And that was such a great thing. Because God had to take it to another level. He couldn't just continue to do things the way he had been doing it. With his mission of saving us. And this mission of salvation and having this relationship. So he had to come down here to earth. With all the people. And not just his chosen people, right? Not just everybody who decided to participate in the sanctuary. But now he's going to be walking amongst all of us. Of all the people at that time. He came down here and became fully human and fully divine at the same time. And I think it's still really hard for us to comprehend all of that, right? All the, all the works of what Jesus did and how he was still God, but he was with us and walked amongst us. In John 1, 14 through 18, it says this, And the word became flesh, and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the one of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, only the begotten Son, who was in the bosom of the Father. He declared him. So we see God moving forward in this mission, right? Christ came down and was presented as flesh to all of us so that we could one day go and be back with the, the Father, right? And be with God. How bad do you think Jesus wanted to come down here? How bad do you think he wanted to live amongst his people? He loved us. He wanted to be with us. But at the same time, it was probably pretty hard to leave everything that he had. Right? If you take us and you transplant us up into heaven, a place where we don't see sin, a place where there's happiness, there's no crime, there's no violence, there's, no, there's none of this, and then say, okay, wait, you got to go back down. It's like, Really? I don't want to go back down, right? So he left behind a lot for his, because of his love that he had for us, that he came down. And the question that we all should have, and the question is, how do we respond to this love? How do we respond to the love of someone who gave their life for us, who left everything to be with us. This love, if we receive this love and we feel this love from Jesus, this love should call us to do a lot. This love should transform us and change us 
from who we are to somebody different. Just how the love of my wife transformed me. Probably a little bit more, right? But when you fall in love, when you really fall in love with somebody, like when I fell in love with my beautiful wife, my whole life was her. All I wanted to do was be with her, to be by her side. It didn't matter what we were doing. She could say, oh, I have to wash the dishes. Well, I want to be there by your side. I thought about her all the time. I spent time with her. All I wanted to do was make her happy. Right? Because of the love that I had for her. She's looking at me from over here. She's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is the love that we should have for Christ and for God. We should want to be with him all the time. We should want to make him happy. This love, if we have this love for God, this love should transform us. So if we are not transformed, what does that mean? That we don't necessarily have that right love for our God. Because he has that love for us. Remember we talked about God marking on the calendar for Pam every day, right? Pam's 10 10 o'clock every day. Right? God looks to search out for us every day. And that love for Christ should transform us. So what is our mission today? What are we supposed to do? Our mission should be his mission too, right? And what is his mission? It's a mission of love and salvation. It's about relationships. It's about being with us. So if you do not have that love for Christ yet and you are not transformed, you're not too late. And I can tell you a place where you can get to know him a little bit. This is where we get to know him. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We're on Wednesday. We're going to get to Thursday. We'll talk a little bit more about that on Thursday. So when we get to um, Wednesday... It talks about, and the title is, God who continues to be with us. Is God still here with us? Not in the flesh, but he's still here with us, right? So, if we read the first couple of uh, sentences here in the lesson, it says this. Jesus' life and ministry were God's ultimate revelation. In about three years, God was able to reveal more about who he is and what his mission was all about than in all that he had done through any method in previous generations. So all that Christ did in three years far exceeded everything else that God had tried to do for man in the past. And just think about that. Think about all the information that Christ gave to us with his works, with who he was, with his words, with his training. He gave so much information to mankind. And all we get to read about is just this, you know, third of the Bible here, right? But think about all of the impact that Jesus had on man, if we were to put it in Bible form, if we were to put everything, all the experiences, every person that he had touched in here, we, we, we wouldn't be able to read it all. It would just be incredible. So Christ, we, we see what Christ has done and we see it in his word, but it, what he had done far exceeded anything that man has ever written. Because of him, we are here today. We're still talking about him, right? And just think of all the stories of the New Testament that, were in, that are incomplete for us. Wouldn't it be nice to know the full story of the demon-possessed man? Or the, the, know the full story and the full length of the man who was blind and now was, was able to see? Or the man who was lame and was lifted up and was able to walk? 
Think about Nicodemus. Think about all the other Bible characters and the people that we ran in, that we run into and read about. And we know about the full story of what, what the influence of Jesus was all the way throughout their life. Jesus touches one, and when Jesus touches one, it's like COVID. It just goes everywhere. It can go everywhere, right? And the, the, just everything that Jesus had and all that he did here just it was just incredible. Just thinking about all that information that he was able to give out and all the impact that he had. Luke 19.10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save which was lost. How many of us are lost here? I'll put two hands up. I'm lost, right? I think we all are. And the mission of God has not changed. That's why he's still here with us. He's still seeking us. He's still trying to save the lost. In the lesson, it asks us to read one of the, probably one of the most famous, well-known verses. It's John 3, 16. It says, For the love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he asked us, the, the lesson asks us, how do you see God's love and mission interacting there? Right? And we see that he came because he loves us. Right? We can see that mission right there in the verse. He came because he loves us. He died because he loves us. All of this mission is about this relationship with us. And all that he did was in his mission. In Matthew 28, verse 18 and 20, it says this. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Right? So Jesus' mission and God's mission is still not over. And it says here that he will be with us until the end. So the answer, is God still here with us? Is yes. God is still with us. He continues to be here. Christ's death was part of the reconciliation and not the end of this whole process and this mission. At the end of Wednesday, we have these questions that we're supposed to re reflect on. And hopefully everybody does read these because some of them are really good. And this one says, in what ways have you, all of us, seen Jesus' promise to be with us always, being fulfilled in your life as you are engaged in his mission? Right? How have we seen Christ in our lives? How have we seen Christ fulfill what he said here, that he will always be with us? A lot of times we, we don't necessarily see it in the now, but when we look back, we see that he's always been there for us. Always. God does not lose focus of his mission. Not like us. We can, we can vary. We can go and come back. But God does not lose focus on his mission. In Revelation 21.3, it says this. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Remember, we talked about the, the relationship that God had with his people in the, in the time of the, the sanctuary, when God was in the sanctuary. Well, Paul, um, or we, we, we see this again when he's talking about the end of the days, and that God will dwell amongst and, and be with his people in the end days. If we go into Thursday, we see that, and we all know, that God will come back for us, right? He will always come back for us. And aren't we all waiting on that? 
Amen to that. In the middle of Wednesday, we'll get into the challenge here in a second. But in the middle of, oh, sorry, Thursday. In the middle of Thursday, we have this fourth paragraph. It says this. It's from Desire of Ages, page 26. The work of redemption will be complete in the place where sin abounded. God's grace much more abounds. The earth itself, the very field that Satan claims as his, is to be not only ransomed, but exalted. Here where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here and where or here where he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men. And through endless ages, as the redeemed walked in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for, the unspe- for this unspeakable gift. God has been with us the whole time. And he will continue to be with us. And he wants to be with us much more than we want to be with him. So now we get into the challenges. It says this, learn the name of someone in your life who you do not, who you don't already know, and begin praying for that person every day. Somebody who we do not know their name. Right? We still, we pray for people, we pray for neighbors, but God is asking us, because I believe this is coming from God, right? God wants us to find the name of somebody and start praying for them. Learn their name and pray for them and watch what God does. Will everybody do this challenge? All right, I saw hands up and amen. Hopefully everybody online can do this as well. Because if we do this, and next week we're going to have more challenges, things can get really exciting. So the lesson... Learning about God and his mission, we need to be a part of his mission as well. So if you have uh, enjoyed this lesson or you like this for for yourself or for somebody else, you can give us a call at 916-457-6511 or you can email us at csh at saccentral.org. Ask for offer C202340. Uh, Thank you so much for being with us here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church for Central Study Hour. May God bless everybody.